Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello and welcome everybody to the next reading of Code Word. Oh, I got code word in there. Hey, it's the divine program of the world's history today. Not code word Barbalon. We finished that, but we were just talking about it. And Brett is waking up right now. It's about uh, 9 a.m. here on this beautiful Sabbath day, Saturday, June 29, 2019. And Yerk Lisman is joining me here to read along with me. Or actually, he is doing the reading, and I'm just here for comment purposes. In the Divine Program, we are uh, well into the book. I believe we're on page 144, Yerk? 150, brother. Oh, I didn't put my marker in there. Oh, did we already? Oh, okay. Gotcha. We're on page 150, yeah. And let me just take it over for a second. Uh, you were always almost misspelling saying uh, to another reading of Cold World Babylon, which of course we ended, I think, uh, quite uh, some eight or nine months ago in the meantime. It has been a very big chore to read that book and discuss that book. But you just experienced that when you uploaded part 36, uh, within hours after uploading, your video was deleted by the YouTube authorities because of quote-unquote hate speech. 
and since then we are promoting to upload this video any, anywhere else. So it is uploaded on Archive, it is uploaded on uh, Brother Michael Spitschu channel, who cannot join us today, who will join us tomorrow probably in this reading of Albert Close. And that's why uh, Brother Brett almost misspake, because this Cold World Babylon situation is of course going through our heads. And it is just, it is just reminding us and with this, we are reminding all of you out there who are watching these videos, please download this work. Take a hard copy of this work. Put it on a USB stick. Put it on an extra disc. Put it on any kind of medium you want to that is away from the computer where you can share it with other people in the future because we never know how long how much longer we can even speak the truth on platforms like YouTube. We are heavily, heavily censored. I mean, the censorship of Code Word Babylon number 36 was such a joke because Brett made a wonderful intro and outro, but only from official mainstream media clips. He put them all together in a very fancy way, nothing about that but not using any hate speech because, well, where in the mainstream do you hear hate speech? Do you hear McCain hate speeching? Do you hear um, George W. Bush hate speeching? Do you hear quote-unquote church authorities hate speeching officially? No, you don't. But they flagged this video anyway. Or somebody flagged this video and Brett really got in trouble with that. And... Now, Brett got in trouble. I also got in trouble already before, before, before for, because of my German videos, mm -hmm. which also don't contain any hate speech. So the point is we can be gone even by the time that this one is airing <laughs> because we are on part 46 of the reading today <laughs> and we have only uploaded 13 or 14 or 15 readings of this book so far because there's so much to do, you know, but the spirit leads us to put this out and... You have to take into consideration that we speak biblical truths and the Antichrist just doesn't like it. He hates it and he will prevent it with every means necessary. Yeah, you know, the end justifies the means, right? So every means they take are all right to prevent us from putting out the real biblical historical proof and history. And that's what we are doing with this wonderful book of... Um, Albert Close, written in the midst of the First World War, the quote-unquote Great War, as they called it, the probably last of all wars, that's at least how they thought in that time. Oh, didn't they know what was coming up in World War II and even beyond that? I'm so sorry. They were so ignorant at those times. But people are ignorant in these times too, and people were ignorant at all times, ignorant against the truth. Because yes, they just true. don't want to hear it. They don't want to study it. They don't want to busy themselves with that. They want to get in their chair, open a bag of chips and a can of Coke and <laughs> fill themselves and watch Super Bowl and Lady Gaga and all these illuminated indoctrinational works the Jesuits put out there and they don't want to think, they don't want to do anything. And this is why we have so little views on all these videos. But again, it's not about the views per se, it is about the people who watch this. It's not the quantity of people, but the quality of people. And the more people watch this, the higher the possibility is that the quality of the people um, will be raising to a top level. And with quality, I mean... People who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, who read and study the Bible, who understand what living in this world is all about, that we are only just in a one big great test to see if we prove ourselves worthy by following the Lamb with us wherever He goes, so that He can give us eternal life when this fleshly life, this carnal life, is over. And that's what's it all about. So, I'd say, without any further ado, let us turn to the book. Because I really love this book from Albert Close, and we are coming to the end. We are on page 150 today. And, um, yeah, like I said, this is page 150 and about the 46th reading, but uh, maybe Brett still has some comments before I 
start opening the pages of this book, Brett? Well, thanks, Jörg. You know, I just uh, think about, um, you know, all the biblical um, consequences. You know, there are all kinds of scripture that point to the latter days, the end times, goes on and on and on, you know, having your conscience seared with a hot iron. I really think that scripture that I put up in that intro video had something to do with the decision of these uh, different internet platforms not to allow the work to be seen or to, you know, uh, block its normal use. Um, you know, it's interesting and rather ironic that the video was removed from everyone seeing it, but if I go into my account, it was still there last night. So I deleted it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, this whole thing with, with making the code work Barbalon videos. I've been taking a lot of time and, and energy into putting... Uh, you know, putting this together. And, and the reason I'm not rushing through it is because I want to uh, make something out of it that grabs the attention. And I think that, you know, I, I may have stumbled upon a nerve there, Yerk. We hit the nerve of the Antichrist, I think, square on the head. And you get a lot of flack when you do that. As Tom has pointed out, as Daryl Eberhardt has pointed out, you know, this is the nature of it. You know, when you really start making an impact, you get, uh, what is that called? Blowback from the Antichrist. That's what I suspect is behind this. What do you think? I totally agree with you. And I just wanted to show this picture of the upload on my archive.org library where this video is to be shown. And uh, we will make sure to put the links uh, on BitChute from Brother Michael's channel and from myarchive.org and from Brett's archive.org library into uh, the description box of this video so that you can have a look at Cold World Babylon 36. Ah, I see. You have a picture of the beast right now. It says, Pence says U.S. to open Jerusalem Embassy before the end of 2019. This was taken from... Minnesota Public Radio or National Public Radio here in the United States. You know, I call it the propaganda network here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. yeah this is wasn't just it the... interesting that clip, Yerk, because they oh, mentioned yeah. uh, Francis Rooney in there, and here he is. Oh yes, well, I would have picked two ecumenical people. You know. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting intro and a very interesting outro. I, I didn't even have time to watch the reading itself yet because it's only three quarters of an hour or something. It's one of our shorter right. videos. Oh, um, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah we get a lot of different topics in there. And I started talking about, you know, my, my experience with um, being a musician and uh, calling out uh, uh, this whole uh, entourage of, of uh, you know, uh, we know in the Bible that the kings of the earth are all taking counsel. We know in the Bible that the merchants of the earth are also doing the same thing, more or less. So they're all in it together. They have to all obey the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. They want to take Jesus Christ's place, and that's effectively what they've done. Well, that's a wonderful um, uh, thing that you just say. Want to take uh, the place of Jesus Christ? Uh, if you allow yeah. me, Brad, I would very yeah, much right. love to start reading the book here, because what you just said is actually coming up in the reading uh, ah, in, a, in a few let's moments. Go. So, yes, let's I think it, it is quite an uh, interesting moment to, or opportune, let's say. That's the word I was looking for. It is quite okay. opportune to start the reading. We are on page 150 in the book, 119 of 168 in the PDF here, so we still have some pages to go. Um, and we are reading here from the second paragraph on the page that states the popes and the ten kings of Europe. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 16, 17, it says, quote, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore.
and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, we read, quote, And there was given unto him, speaking of the beast, a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Blasphemy in scripture means not so much speaking against God, as the assumption of divine attributes or divine power where no rightful claim exists, or to attribute them to men, to devils or to idols, honors or works which belong to God only. For example, the Pharisees charged Jesus with casting out devils by the power of the devil, and he replied that in attributing this power to the devil, they had committed the unpardonable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit, as you can verify in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 28 through 30, and in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 28. In view of these facts, who can deny that the popes have committed blasphemy in claiming to be infallible or, <clears throat> what is worse, to be Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of the flesh, as Antichrist Pius X claimed in 1895 when Archbishop of, Ven of Venice, as we see that in every particular the papal power fits this prophecy like a key fits its lock. Here's what he said. The Catholic National for July 13th, 1895, quotes the following words, then recently uttered by the Archbishop of Venice, the late Pope Antichrist Pius X. Quote, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? Ah, it is Jesus Christ who speaks. Does the Pope accord a favor or pronounce an anathema? It is Jesus Christ who pronounces the anathema or accords of uh, the favor. So that when the Pope speaks, we have no business to examine. We have only to obey. We have no right to criticize his decisions or discuss his commands. Therefore, everyone who would wear the crown, ought to submit himself to divine right. End wow. quote. Now the following description of the Pope as God is given by the late quote-unquote mother, Margaret Mary Hallam. Margaret Mary Hallam was born in 1803 and died in 1868, and she was an English Catholic nun, and was the foundress of the Dominican congregation of St. Catherine of Siena. In other words, a special order of the Roman Catholic Church, a nunnery order, a um, Dominican nunnery, you know, really nuns who committed to the Dominican style of worship. And we all know that the Dominicans were the persecutors of real Christians because they were endowed with the actions of the Inquisition all through the years before. So, quite an extreme order. There is also a link to Wikipedia where you can read about Margaret Hallahan. Now, what did Margaret Hallahan write in her the book Life of Mother Margaret Mary Hallahan on page 430? Quote, When I heard him sing Mass, I cannot express what I felt. It was the God of earth prostrate in adoration before the God of heaven. Unquote. Now this, dear brother, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Any comments there, brother? Oh, uh, I was, uh, yeah, still waking up over here, bro. Not really <laughs> functioning properly. 
anyway, but this is um, why, I th why I thought this was a quite an opportune moment to start the reading because dealing oh, with yes. what you just said. Well, this and quote, Jörg, uh, uh, you know, my jaw just hit the floor when you read this and I'm kind of through me. Threw you me speak off. of the quote from uh, Antichrist Pius X? Yes. Okay, let's read it again. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It's Jesus Christ who speaks. Does the Pope accord a favor or pronounce an anathema? It's Jesus Christ who pronounces the anathema or accords the favor. So that when the Pope speaks, we have no business to examine. We have only to obey. We have no right to criticize his decisions or discuss his commands. Therefore, everyone who would wear the crown ought to submit himself to divine right. Unquote. This is again this last sentence. Everyone who would wear the crown ought to submit himself to divine right. This is again a typical Roman Catholic explanation of Romans chapter 13. That, wow. every, that everybody should bow down to the powers because there is no power that is not of God, right? Right. And the Roman Catholic Church loves to twist the Bible and, of course, thinks that she is, by divine right, ordained as a ruler of the world, which she is not, because we know that the Roman Catholic Church is nothing else but the synagogue of Satan. It is the church of the devil in disguise after the mask of quote-unquote Christianity, where this Christianity is as far from the real Christianity as... Uh, it's not so easy to pick an example. <laughs> no, there, that can really make the point. No, this is really a complicated matter because... Look at all of the people on earth that just follow follow them the whole thing, uh, this whole indoctrination, all of it. I mean, we were just talking about this, Yerk, right before the session, and now I'm reminded that this traditional form of worship, this traditional form of just going through the motions of life, just trying to get by, just trying to make enough money to pay all the bills and keep the wife happy, keep the children happy. You know, this is our heritage, right? So yeah. there's some problems with our heritage. And I think when we're talking about the Bible, when we're talking about indoctrination, we're talking about scripture, and we talk about the seventh day, I think that hits a nerve like Nothing else. <laughs> it really does, you know. Yeah, I think if anything could divide uh, people into hatred, it would be discussions on the Sabbath. Because it seems to me, Yerk, that every time I try and discuss this topic with anyone in a vulgar way, they have such disdain. I mean, I've never seen so much before. In my humble opinion, Brett, I think that that is just the proof that the Sabbath is the seal of God and who doesn't care about the Sabbath has the mark of the beast. Well, yeah. right, and the yeah. Bible talks about having victory over the mark, and that's what we need to remind our brethren about, is because, you know, we're, we've all taken the mark of, be of the beast at some point in our lives. I have, too. I really thought that there, this is something different than what it really is, biblically, you know? I was deceived, and maybe I still am to some degree. But, you know, the repentance so important, but you're, go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't want to sound any uh, Seventh-day Adventist-like with what I just said. But no, point, no, 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 no. See, it's almost a private thing, see, but when you share some with someone in the public realm, well, you know, I worship on Sabbath, which is Saturday, they just, it just throws them for a head spin. No, well, we worship on Sunday. 
okay, well, it's not worship, it's rest. So we get it all wrong to begin with by talking about worship. So no, 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 it's not worship, it's rest. Because on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And we are supposed to enter his rest, it says in the Bible. And it's so confusing that way. So it's like butting heads over something that is so personal. Yeah, you know, nobody comes up to you and discusses um, the commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. Everybody yeah. agrees. Everybody agrees that we should not uh, talk um, in lies to our neighbors, right? That's true. That's Everybody true. agrees that we should not covet. Everybody agrees that we should not yes. commit adultery. Yes. But when it comes to Sabbath, they say, oh, no, 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 that's done away with. I mean, Jesus could, is our Sabbath, yeah. We could start a complete new discussion now out of this reading, but we have done that so many times. And oh, I know. I, I think know, I true. think we made our point clear, and you know the people who don't want to listen to us in, 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 us in this regard, no problem. You know, I am not here to save you. Jesus is here to save you. There we go. Yeah, that's that's his job, not ours. That's, that's his right. job. We can only show the way. We can only do what Jesus told us to do. He said, "Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every living creature." That's what he said. That's what we do. Whether you take the gospel from us or you don't take the gospel from us, that's something that you have to make out for yourself and that is something that you have to make out with Jesus Christ for yourself in your personal relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ. Not with us. You know, I don't care anymore. I can <laughs> tell you... Yeah, that's is, right, Jürgen. I can That's tell what's you. important to do. Yeah, we don't share our pearls with swine. But listen, we're just trying to say, you know, you ought to really consider what the Bible says. Not what we say. No, 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 no. It's what the Bible's trying to say. And it's saying it over and over and over. But then again, you might be stuck in one of the revised standard versions of the Bible that they started in 1870. You know, you got to look at the historical fact that Roman Catholicism has been at war with the, the, the Reformation Bible throughout history. Right, Yerk? Well, let's say it even uh, a little bit harder. The Roman Catholic Church has been in war with the Word of God, the Bible, all throughout her existence. And mm -hmm. when the Reformation brought out the Bible in the vulgar language in many countries over here in Europe, the Roman Catholic Church was furious. Yeah, it was Furious revolt. beyond was comprehension. Revolt. And the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic Church could not do anything because the devil cannot do anything when you stand in front of him and you hold up the Word of God. The devil runs! Yes, it's true. You do exactly what Ignatius Loyola did in his spiritual exercises when he, quote-unquote, had a vision that he in a cave was chasing the devil, beating him with a stick. Yep, well, that's, that's, why that's the what Bible you can says. do. That's what you can do without any spiritual exercises by taking the Bible and slamming that Bible on the head of the devil. He will not allow it. He will run because he can't stand the truth. He can stand in the way of the truth. Read Matthew chapter 4. Read Luke chapter 4. The, um, what's, it, what's it said? Uh, the hmm. temptation of Jesus Christ when he hmm. was 40 days in, uh, in the desert without anything to eat, without anything to drink, without any sleep probably. And he was tempted by the devil, and the devil said, do this and do this and do this. And Jesus replied, it is written, it is written, it is written. And the third time he said, it is written, the devil took a run and didn't come back. He cannot stand in the light of the truth. And when you have a real understanding of the truth and you follow the truth, the devil cannot stand in your life. Jesus will protect you because God does not put you into temptation. It is the devil who leads you into temptation, not God. 
And when you follow his commandments, when you do what Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments, well, then you have to keep them. And now make it very short and then let's return back to the book. You show me where Jesus Christ said, uh, all commandments are still valid, but the fourth I abolish. If you show me that in scripture, then I will never ever say that the Sabbath is still valid the seventh day. If you can't, then you have a problem, and not I. And for the record, neither Brett nor I are Seventh-day Adventists. The Sabbath was invented at the end of Creation Week, and that is long time before there was any Jew, long time before there was any Seventh-day Adventist, there were only two men on that earth at that moment, and that was the man Adam and the woman Eve. They were there when the Sabbath was ordained, the seventh day, where God rested from all the work he hath made on six days. So the Sabbath is a rest for all of man. Not only for Seventh-day Adventists, not only for the Jews, for every man, every child of God, and we are all children of God. Some obey and some disobey. Are you a parent? Do you have a son or a daughter? Do, you, do your children always obey you or are they sometimes disobeying your orders? Well, then you know that's exactly the same thing that happens here on a spiritual realm with our Father in Heaven. Many men just rebel against their Father. They don't want to adhere to His law. And that's what it's all about. Obeying or not obeying. And that gives you sanctification or it gives you damnation. Your choice. Yep, that's what I, exactly what I wanted to say, Yerk, was the Bible says, choose this day whom you will serve. So, let's make it clear. And let's move on. I'm ready. Exposure in Paris churches in May 1871, the author continues. 1871, by the way, that's the year also of the founding of the Second German Reich, the first free Protestant mm -hmm. Reich by Bismarck, that we will talk of probably a little bit later. But in 1871 AD, in May, when the quote-unquote Red Republicans held possessions of Paris, shocking discoveries were made in the nunneries and churches of that city. The correspondent of the Edinburgh Daily Review stated that, quote, 15 corpses, or rather skeletons of young women, dating not more than 10 years or so back, were found in a crypt under the church of Saint Laurent, not far from the North Railway Station, and physicians inferred from the distorted state of their heads and members that they had suffered indescribable anguish before dying. That crypt is still exhibited to the public. I quote. The correspondent of the Paul Mall Gazette, referring to the horrors discovered in the vaults of the Church of Notre Dame de Victoire, wrote, quote, in another vault, the bodies of four women recently buried were discovered, and in a small lateral vault, a couple of gold bracelets were picked up. On the, vault, on the wall of the vault was plainly visible the mark left by a jeweled arm, and it is evident that the lady with the bracelets must have struggled in the vault which had been newly painted when she was confined in it." Unquote. An English physician resident in Paris in 1871 tells what he saw during the official investigation made within the dungeon vaults of the church of Le Petit Père. Le Petit Père, that is French for the Little Fathers. Quote, Many bodies of women in their ordinary dress, without any coffin, where they are found buried in a slanting position. One body was that of a fine, handsome woman, but recently interred, and there were signs on the walls of a terrible struggle having taken place before she was bound and buried. Buried gradually, and buried, there can be little doubt, buried alive. Otherwise, why buried 
in a slanting position. Unquote. It should be mentioned that these burials were not ordinary interments or nuns within their own convents. This was the excuse Roman Catholic apologists, Roman Catholic apologists offered. These women were buried in their own ordinary dress. For 50 years previous to 1871, all interments within Paris churches had been strictly forbidden by law, so that these burials were secret, utterly unknown to the outside world. The author, so speaking of Albert Close himself, had great difficulty in 1913 in finding this church in Paris. No one seemed to have heard of it. By chance he discovered that it was one and the same church as the Church of Notre Dame de Victoire. This is, by the way, written wrongly here. We are going to have a little picture of that um, basilica within a moment, because I'm just looking this up. I prepared this a little bit, luckily. So, <laughs> wow. um, this is not the Notre Dame that was on fire a short time ago. Yeah, Don't mix that up. This is another Notre Dame church. It's this one. Yeah? Ooh, it looks like the Church of the Jesu. It looks a little bit like the Church of the Jesu, yeah. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, just a little bit. So, um, this one, and uh, we are going back to the picture right now, when you go to Wikipedia, Basilica of Notre Dame de Victoire, so you see here where it is written wrong, it says here victories, but that's an English word. It is Notre Dame de Victoire, so that is Our Lady of Victories, yeah? Uh, mm. But then you should translate it also off victories, then it makes sense. So this is the French name, Notre Dame de Victoire in Paris. When you open that uh, link on Wikipedia, you read, quote, Blessed John Henry Newman, you know, the convert from Protestantism into Catholicism, who became bishop and then later cardinal in England and who was founding the new uh, sanctioned dioceses in England after the Oxford movement in the 1850s that uh, James Edgar Wiley wrote excessively about in his book Rome and Civil Liberty. This blessed John Henry Newman went there to the church, the Basilica of Notre Dame de Victoire, to give thanks for his conversion from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism, which had been the subject of prayer there. Interesting, huh? What you find out when you do a little study on this and that during a book reading like this. So, we have this picture here, and now we are going inside that church. And there you will see a statue above the east transept altar of Notre Dame de Victoire in its eponymous basilica. The woman and the child. The Queen of Heaven. Not the Virgin Mary. Not the physical mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the Queen of Heaven with her crown and the child in her arms, standing on what is probably supposed to be the world, right? Even though it most looks more like a football. <laughs> like yeah, a, or a soccer, soccer ball. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Football Strange. over here, soccer ball. What you yeah, that's say in America, true. Yeah. Isn't that funny how they twist that around? Yeah, but uh, on the other way, then soccer and all these ball games are just games in uh, veneration of the sun god, S U N sun god, Nimrod. And therefore, you can read a publication of the UNESCO itself. It is not me who says that, it is uh, the official um, medium of the uh, United Nations organization called UNESCO that. Uh, put that out in a paper. So you don't have to believe me, search it out for yourself. I did, so I tell you. So whether you believe me or you look it up for yourself. Okay? And so when they use a ball here, which I don't think it is because it is uh, a few hundred years old, that church was erected in the 17th century, if I remember correctly, then of course there was no football yet or no soccer yet, <laughs> but still it looks like a soccer ball. And even though a soccer ball is a, refers, uh, is a reference to the sun, to sun worship. And uh, I think, of course, the Queen of Heaven and her child, which is Semiramis and Tammuz, is a reference to the sun god Nimrod. Right? Yeah. So, 
that's so yeah. far for with these pictures here that we see. So the author had great difficulty in 1913 in finding this church in Paris. No one seemed to have heard of it. Just by chance, he discovered that it was one and the same church as the church of Notre Dame de Victoire. This church stands in the square named Le Petit Père, eh? the Little Fathers, and the English physician had given it its, this name, evidently not knowing its correct designation. The correspondent of the Paul Mall Gazette gave it its correct name. Here, therefore, we have two independent accounts of the horrors exposed at this church. They agree exactly as to the facts, but are differently expressed. These papers may be consulted in the British Museum Library and at the head offices of the various newspapers on permission being asked. It might open the eyes of some of our, quote, broad-minded advanced thinkers, unquote, if they would look up these, black, these back numbers. An educated Parisian lady informed the writer in 1913 that people frequently disappeared during these days of the Second Empire when Emperor Napoleon III and the Empress Eugenie would be dependent upon, uh, upon to shield the priesthood if investigations were pressed too far. Now, who knows what goes on to this day behind Romish stone walls and bolted doors? Ha! <laughs> yeah, this is a very profound question. Who knows what goes on to this day, even in 2019, behind Romish stone walls and bolted doors? To this day in Ireland, and we are speaking of the beginning of the 20th century, and in other Roman Catholic lands, quote-unquote heretics disappear, and the distracted friends know not where to look for the missing loved ones. Reverend Thos Connellan, editor of the Catholic in Dublin, an ex-Roman Catholic priest who now conducts a most successful mission to Roman Catholics in Dublin, will be able to supply the actual names of converts who have disappeared from Ireland after leaving the Church of Rome. No one knows where they are today. If ever a revolutionary party should break open the bolted and barred doors of Rome, in Britain and in Ireland, well, probably the same secrets will come to light as in Paris in the Church Notre Dame de Victoire in 1871. 1873 Jesuits were expelled from Germany by Bismarck. The law was put into place in 1872, then they got some time to get out, so they were expelled in 1873. These Jesuits were regarded as a peril to the new empire. Since 1555, they have been expelled by the various governments of Europe over 40 times for their devilish, intriguing practices. The young Emperor William, however, afterwards secretly made them his friends in fomenting the Great War of 1914 AD. This tells you that the German Emperor William betrayed the country he was supposed to serve. Now, is that any news under the sun, Brett? No, no, not at all. Especially not when you think of America, right? No, of course not. I mean, just look at what's going on now. Same thing, different day and age, different set of circumstances. Quite a bit more sophisticated, I would say. They try to hide it a little bit more on the outside, but they cannot fool us real history students. Now, 1874 to 1874, four, four, sorry, 1872 to 1874, a great revival took place under Moody and Sankey, and I give you the two links to Wikipedia that you can look up Dwight Moody and Ira D. Sankey. This great revival took place in England, Scotland and Ireland. Thousands in all ranks and stations of life awakened and led to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Moody, by the way, I found out when looking at the Wikipedia page, was a collaborator with uh, Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, 
a wonderful Protestant preacher of the 19th century. And he supported Moody, so he probably had some real good godly intentions. Thousands in all ranks and stations of life awakened and led to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Many unconverted ministers of the gospel converted and filled with the Spirit of God. Reverend Dr. Dale of Birmingham declared that the marvelous results, apart from the man's message, convinced him that the movement was a divine visitation. Henry Drummond and other great scholars heartily cooperated. Moody proclaimed that the Christian ministry is a divine institution and that God had for years been using this ministry in Britain to sow the seed to the word of God. He, as an evangelist, was only the reaper. He honored the Christian ministry and in time they honored and cooperated with him all over the land. Sankey's hymns set the world singing the gospel. The great halls founded during the great revival continue in these days of declension to be crowded to the doors. Stratford Conference Hall in the east end of London is crowded year in year out by congregations from 1,500 to 2,000 men and women, fully half being men. The same applies at the Great Mile End Assembly Hall. Political questions are rigorously excluded from all services. Was Moody's message and power God's rebuke to the ministry which had buried the gospel in modern profound theology? Before this great revival swept over the land, the scholars had been telling the Christian church that the old manifestations of previous revivals would not be repeated as God never repeats himself. God's answer to this false reasoning was Moody with his message which shocked the ears of some and won the hearts of multitudes. He was direct and he was simple. He preached heaven, hell, resurrection and judgment as well as the other sides of the gospel. Some scholars are telling the same old story again, that old manifestations will not be repeated. Well, the answer again is, look at Manchuria in 1910 AD. I didn't have any time to look this fact up, so maybe you can do your own studies on this fact. I don't know what to do with this yet. Some men never learn by the experience of history, but measure everything by their own meager experience in winning men to Christ. And then we continue with the Keswick Convention that was, found, that was founded in 1874 AD. This great movement has powerfully influenced the teaching of the Christian Church throughout the world. In 1915, about 5,000 Christians from all over the world met at the annual convention in Keswick in Cumberland. Six missionary bishops were present. This body consists of members of all Christian churches and perhaps no school of thought is so true to the teaching of the gospel and to the interpretations of the reformers and great leaders who have founded our missionary societies and other great permanent institutions of the Christian Church. The present day leaders are represented by such men as Reverend F. B. Meyer, Prebendary Webb Peplow, Master, Right Reverend Bishop Taylor Smith, Church of England Chaplain General to the British Army, Reverend Evan Hopkins, Editor of Life of Faith, Bishop Handley Mole, D.D., Bishop of Durham, and many other great evangelical leaders. In 1874, we continue our history where it says in 1859 the idea of crushing Protestantism in Britain was taking shape in Cardinal Manning's mind. In a sermon before Cardinal Wiseman he said, quote, England is the head of Protestantism, the center of its movements and the stronghold of its power. Weakened in England, it is paralyzed everywhere. Conquered in England, it is conquered throughout the world. Once overthrown here, all else is but a warfare of detail. Unquote. He said that in a sermon before Cardinal Wiseman, August 6, 1859, the famous Cardinal Manning. In 1874, that same Cardinal spoke of the only way to restore the Pope's temporal power. 
because you know the Pope's temporal power was taken away between 1867 uh, 1866 and 1870 yeah so here he speaks of how to restore the temporal power he says quote there is only one solution of the difficulty a solution I fear impending and that is the terrible scourge of continental war a war which will exceed the horrors of any of the wars of the first empire And it is my firm conviction that in spite of all obstacles, the vicar of Jesus Christ will be put again in his own rightful place, but that day will not be until his adversaries shall have crushed each other with mutual destruction. Unquote. Now, Brett, I think this is a very opportune moment also to bring our reading for today to an end, because this is something people should reflect on a little bit. People should think about a little bit. Cardinal Manning, 40 years, remind the number, 40 years before the outbreak of World War I, the great war that many people thought would be the last war, he says here that this war is necessary to restore the Pope's temporal power in the world. Now, we from history know now that during this war in 1915, I don't know if you are aware of that, Brett, but I am because oh, yeah. I read Behind the Dictators. Mm. In 1915, there was fomented a secret treaty in London mm. where on the German side, a, a certain Matthias Erzberger was the founder of that treaty for a very great part. And that laid out the ground rules for giving back the Vatican the temporal power it lost in 1870. The secret treaty took place or was formed in 1915, that is in the height of World War I, by a German who was minister of propaganda already in, the, uh, in that time and who later became the minister or uh, the secretary uh, of, of, uh, of finance so that is the treasurer or something how do you say that in America yeah that's right treasurer yeah, the, the treasurer in, uh, in the Weimar Republic which is the quote unquote democracy that mm -hmm. followed up the German Reich after the fall in uh, 1918 after the ending of the first world war and when Germany went in shame to Versailles to receive the world Verdict of uh, they have to bear all the responsibility for the First World War, and Germany was plucked apart by that, and that led, of course, to the um, famous quote of uh, Field Marshal Foch, who said, "We are not signing a peace treaty here, but we are signing a 20-year truce." That's what he said in 1919. Ten years later, the Vatican was restored, and another ten years later, the Second World War broke out. So, I think that the listeners of this video now have to do some homework and inform themselves about the secret treaty of London in 1915. Uh, you can go to Leo Herbert Lehman's book Behind the Dictators and read in one of the last chapters of the book, I think it is uh, chapter 12 even, it is uh, Pro-Germanism of Pius XII, um, where that is mentioned, and you can look that up, or you can go to my reading of the book on my channel, Jogla66, or you can just download the book on the internet and read it for yourself. You can also download the book in German, because Brother uh, Victor completely translated the book Behind the Dictators in German, and I have that on my archive.org. So that book is available in English and in German, and the videos are available in English and in German. So there is much material for you to study out there, to inform yourself, and to get a better view on history, and to understand even this, what the author is speaking here about, when Cardinal Manning says, in 1874, this Great war is needed to reinstall the temporal power of the Pope that has been taken away in 1870. Wow. Isn't that a wonderful climax to stop the reading on, Brad, for today? It sure is. And you know this quote you just read right here, Cardinal Manning. I believe there is a similar quote, if not the same quote, 
in the book Rome Behind the Great War. And I'll tell you, when I got to that point in the book, it was just hard to bear. Uh, that Rome Behind the Great War, that is from Kensett, right? Yeah, J.A. Kensett. J.A. Kensett, yeah, a wonderful book that we also should read when we have the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really wonderful. A short book, too. Not yeah, long. a short book, I know, but the problem is when we are done with this uh, Albert yeah. Forces book, we should return to the great exodus of James. Yes, I Wiley. agree. I absolutely agree. No doubt. Because we don't of, have enough time to read everything. <laughs> no. Certainly people can go look at the themselves and read it for themselves you know it's small enough where it doesn't take too long to get through it you know some 60 pages or something huh? mm-hmm. yep Very yeah good. brother i leave it up to you to bring this uh, broadcast to an end today to finish it up uh, thank you very much for the invitation and um, i'm glad i could do the reading today and i hope that i and you that we both succeeded in giving the people a little bit more biblical wisdom and a little bit more historical understanding so that they can start to see the world how it really is and uh, I, for my part, say thanks for watching, thanks for listening. Read your Bible. Until next time, Maranatha. Now, please, Brad. Thank you, Yerk. And again, uh, looking greatly forward to continuing in this portion of the book as we get closer to the end. And I think that we are going to be on a real doozy of a ride here in the next coming days doing the next readings in this because we're going to start uncovering some of the really ugly truths that have plagued the beginning of the 20th and 21st century where we're living right now. And they're not that easy to deal with. And, you know, these world wars definitely had a huge impact at the time. A huge impact. Completely changed the landscape of the world. So we're living in a very fallen world that has been war-torn in various places. And then we have arrogant people that reign over the bloody ruin of all sides. And, you know, it's pretty scary. So, with that, we'll catch up with everyone next time. And we encourage you to read your Bible, study on your own, and come to your own conclusions. And uh, we hope to see you back here. And we'll catch up with you then. Bye-bye. God bless. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. 
or that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.